Taste pleasure, taste pleasure, taste pleasure. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to Cosmic Skeptic who runs an atheist and now vegan, apparently, YouTube channel. Cosmic Skeptic has been a vegan for maybe two years or so, but he is already a vegan preacher. Yes, that happens quickly in the vegan community. You get elevated to celebrity status pretty, pretty fast. Now he is at the vegan camp out 2021 and he's gonna hold a speech. Let's check it out. I have been, um, I've been doing this now for just over two years, having ditched animal products in April of 2019, but compared to some of the other- Yeah, as I just said in the intro, he's been vegan for roughly two years and is already a vegan preacher. It's so crazy to see. Most of the time, vegans that are huge within the vegan community have been vegan for one, two, three, maybe four years, because that is the main threshold. After that, everybody degenerates, disintegrates and stops veganism. This is nothing new. I can't wait to see him in a couple of years. The veterans of, of this festival, that still makes me relatively new to animal rights advocacy. And I should say how thankful I am for the vegan community for so hospitably embracing this pretentious atheist YouTuber into its, into its fold. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see. Yeah, it's absolutely heartwarming and now they're embracing you and just wait when you turn ex-vegan. They will hate you. They will start making YouTube videos about you, how you did it wrong. <laughs> um, oh man, poor guy. For a time, for a long time before I made anything, uh, any kind of content about animal rights, I was almost exclusively what you'd call an atheist YouTuber. I was making content discussing uh, faith, debating the religious, and um, I have been asked once or twice what I thought about veganism. It's a topic that comes up every now and again, but it was easy enough to ignore. But I, I, I kind of understood that it was wrong. I saw what people thought eating meat was wrong, but I thought it was- That's funny to me as well, because it was easy to ignore when we're talking about veganism, but why isn't it easy to ignore when we're talking about God? Atheists will always talk about the flying spaghetti monster in the sky, but why don't you debate the flying spaghetti monster in the sky? You're always debating God, because internally you do know that there is a God. Atheists are constantly in denial and they have to debate, they have to discuss in order to justify their own worldview. It is very similar to the LGBTQA whatever community. They know internally that something is wrong. So instead of facing their own demons, they will try to change the exterior. It is always the same. If we only find enough rights groups, enough people that do agree with me, then I must be right. It is a popularity contest. This is what you see in this modern day and age, all under the premise of so-called democracy. We all vote and we determine what is right and what is wrong. This is the society that we live in. This is why atheists seek to find other atheists that will tell them, you are right, there is no God. Yes, and now it is right as well. Just eat the plants. It is correct. It is ethically correct. It is moral. But there are no universal morals. <laughs> it's wrong in the way that lying is wrong or something. Like, yeah, sure, it's not a great thing to do. Um, Why is lying wrong? But everybody does it. Why? And you know, it's not that bad. And at any rate, I know I can get away with doing it for a long time without anybody giving me any backlash. So um, it was kind of like when I'd walk past. Uh, yeah, I rest my case. Yet again, you can do it because nobody else is giving you any backlash. Is this how we establish what is right and wrong? Just because others give us backlash? That is insane. Look at all the different societies with all the different cultures, with all the different practices. Who determines what is right and wrong? If we see female circumcisions in some African village, how do we determine that that is wrong, even though they see it as right? Where does right and wrong come from? Books about giving to charity. And I thought, look, I, I don't need to buy this book. 
Right? I, I understand, I understand what the problem is. I don't need to be convinced that giving to charity is good. It was the same thing with animal rights. I get the point. But then I decided to actually get down to it, and I read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, and I suddenly realized just how catastrophically wrong I'd been. Like so many others, I'd been scammed into thinking that the animals I were eating uh, had a relatively good life uh, before their uh, demise. And the okay, but wait a second. So you read a book and now you know that all the animals are treated badly. How? How exactly? If you would have said, I went to countless farms, to countless animal industries even, and I saw it firsthand over and over and over again, I reported it, I saw it with my own eyes, then you would have a case. But you didn't do that. You didn't go out into the real world. You simply watched a couple of vegan documentaries and read a book. How do you know? So I was actually doing them a favor by making sure they stay in existence, by uh, making sure I was continuing to buy them. Um, it's, it's an interesting point, actually, this, this argument that, uh, that, that by, if, if, we, if everyone went vegan overnight, you know, uh, that the animals would go extinct and that we're doing them a favor by bringing them into existence. Especially given that I'm simultaneously met with the fear that if everybody goes vegan overnight, what are we going to do with all the animals? They're going to overrun us. It's like a simultaneous fear that the animals, that the cows are going to overrun us and we won't know what to do with them, but at the same time a fear that they're going to go extinct. It's like people can't make up their minds on this. But interestingly, there is a rebuttal to this particular point that comes from a rather unlikely source, I think, of Robert Nozick who in Anarchy, State and Utopia, I think um, it's not often stressed, a lot of people don't seem to know, uh, talked about, briefly, animal rights, or at least the eating of animals. And I think in the true libertarian spirit that any true libertarian should ascribe to, uh, he seems sympathetic to the idea that we shouldn't be eating animals. And when he considered this idea that by eating animals we might actually be doing them a favor by making them stay into existence... The idea of animal rights is absolutely laughable and ridiculous. Let's start with animals not being able to participate in society whatsoever. They have no speech, they cannot vote, they cannot buy land, they cannot participate at all, they cannot work. The only reason why we keep animals is to nourish people or as pets. They are not part of society. And please, don't start with the so-called vegan argument. Name the trait. It doesn't make sense either. Because if we would have a society out of humans that could not vote, could not speak, could not work, then we wouldn't have a society to begin with. This is where the discussion starts and ends. Animals are not part of the society, therefore they do not deserve any rights whatsoever. And where do you start and where do you stop? Because if you go into nature, into the wild, animals still will be eating animals. On a monstrous scale, how many insects die in nature every single day? How many fish get eaten by one whale alone? It doesn't add up. You can't start giving those animals any rights because they are not part of society either. Well, he asks that if our taste buds changed and we no longer found it enjoyable to eat animals, should those people who are concerned, who make this argument that we're doing them a favor, even though they don't like the way it tastes anymore, just continue to breathe them into existence and eat them? Yeah, absolute mental illness. You don't ask the question why it tastes good. You grew up in a system that is already heavily plant-based. Everybody grows up on sludge. You're eating cornflakes, you're eating sandwiches in England, you're eating beans and whatnot for breakfast. It is very, very plant-based already and the meat that you eat is some processed gunk. Most people, unfortunately, haven't even experienced a proper human diet. It's quite sad, but this is the way that we live. Now, if you look at meat in its raw state, let's talk about sashimi, salmon sashimi. Why does it taste good? Has it been cooked? Are there any spices on it? Some sort of fancy recipe? No, salmon just tastes great. If you bite into a salmon, raw, even living, it tastes amazing. Why is that so? Because it is our species-specific diet. What does that mean? It means it is nutritionally 
adequate for your biology. That's what it means. This is why vegans try to mimic animal foods over and over again. They are starving for animal flesh because, yet again, it is nutritionally adequate. This is what is tasty to you. Do you understand? If you bite into grass, it tastes disgusting. It's not food. On the other hand, if you look at the cow, the cow thoroughly enjoys eating grass. Why? Because it is perfectly suited for the physiology, for the biology of that cow. This is what taste truly is. This is why fat tastes really, really good. This is why protein satiates us like nothing else. Try going on a low protein diet and you're going to be constantly hungry. It is because protein and fats nourish us. This is what we need. We need the cholesterol, we need the carnitin, etc, etc. This is taste, but you grow up in a society where you eat cookies and then you think it is all about taste pleasure. Aside from that, taste pleasure is nothing bad. Yet again, you're here on this world to enjoy yourself a little bit. If you eat adequately, it will taste good. Wow, mind blown. Anyway, out of a virtuous behavior, it's obviously ridiculous. And I have to say that I'm quite embarrassed that I spent so long of my life uh, contributing to this kind of <laughs> stuff without really giving it a proper... The only reason why you're still here is because you've been eating animal foods. <laughs> Man, keep on going like this, you're gonna starve and you're gonna be an ex-vegan like anybody else. How about your idols, Sam Harris, right? He's such a smart atheist, just like yourself. He went vegan, why is he not vegan anymore? Is he not smart enough? Is he not philosophically deep enough? Can't he reflect on the animal suffering? Is he not empathetic enough? Why is that? Simple, because you listen to his buddy, and you will too at some point. The second thought, I'm often asked <laughs> if I judge people who continue to purchase uh, animal products. And I have to say that there's only one person I can legitimately judge in that regard, and it's my former self. Having oh, spent 20 years of my life contributing to this industry. Wow, your personal Jesus. I consider what I'm doing now, this kind of stuff, as a way of making up for it, as a way of... It is hilarious to see how religious atheists or vegans truly are. You can clearly see that this man is seeking some sort of validation, some sort of value, some sort of moral high ground in his life. This is why he holds this speech here like in an alcoholic anonymous group. I ate flesh, but now I don't anymore. Find a, as a way of trying to find a way to forgive myself, because... God knows that if the animals that I was responsible Who knows? for torturing, killing, and abusing <laughs> were given the opportunity, they sure as hell wouldn't forgive me. Uh, so that's why I'm here. First and foremost, animals don't have a concept of forgiveness whatsoever. Animals are in the moment. That is their natural state. They're just here. They're pure awareness. You, on the other hand, can reflect because you are a human. You're not an animal, <laughs> contrary to popular vegan and atheist belief. But what did you just say there? Why do you use those terms? God only knows, right? God only knows. How come, if you don't believe in God, that you're still using those phrases? As I said, why don't you say, science only knows? It is ridiculous. It is embedded in you, as it is in every human being. You do understand if there is a creation, there is a creator. But the point of the story is, this is of course a false religion, yet again, where you have to practice repentance to the animals. The animals become your god, they become your idols, and now you have to let go of the shame. <laughs> Today, right, because one glance, a single glance, at the cages, at the gas chambers, Oh. rape racks, at the macerators. One glance at all of this immediately shattered any illusions that I was harboring about animal welfare. One glance. Where do you see that? Do you visit farms yet again? And on top of that, as always, super emotional speech. And that's all they got. I immediately realized that this is an issue that demands attention. And that's why, despite only ever having wanted to just talk about philosophy of religion on YouTube, I now stand before you today as an animal. But why do you want to talk about philosophy and religion if you're not <laughs> religious, if you don't believe in God? Let's take an example. I personally practice jiu-jitsu and I go to the gym. I think that cricket is a pretty dumb sport, but I'm not going to sit here and make a career out of <laughs> talking about cricket and convincing people that cricket is not a real sport. 
It is crazy. Of course, you have an obsession with God. It's only natural. Rights advocate, a line of work that I never ever thought that I would be getting into, but now one oh, wow. that I can't imagine my life without. Must have been say, destiny. I began life on YouTube as a person who was discussing the philosophy of religion, uh, debating, debating the religious, and I was sometimes dealing with people who would blindly follow their faith into some of the most evil and irrational of doctrines and behaviors. I was no stranger to <laughs> irrationality, to people living in denial, to faith-based thinking, but I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, that despite my years of arguing with religious fanatics... Okay, let me cut you off right there, but now you are absolutely rational, right? <laughs> Your motivation is not emotional whatsoever, right? It's not irrational at all. It's absolutely rational not to eat your species-specific diet. It's absolutely rational, it's super rational to eat something that no human being has ever eaten. Especially as an atheist who believes in evolution, you must know on some level that we are biologically perfectly suited to eat meat and biologically not adapted to eat plants. So where is the rationale? It is of course ridiculous. It is a religion. It is super emotional and has nothing to do with rationale. And, and wow. Dogmatic Christian nationalists and would-be theocrats. I have genuinely never witnessed more dogma, more ignorance, more evil, right? more evil. faith-based thinking, and indeed <laughs> I might even say more religiosity than I've ever seen. Wow. Uh, when I started about when I started talking about animal rights, I mean the Christian right wing doesn't even come close in terms of the kind of dogma and ignorance that we're dealing with. Talking about projection, you stand there like a total evangelical. <laughs> preaching to the choir. You're not capable of receiving any type of critique yourself. If we would show you the science that vegans are always searching for, if we would show you the digestive track of humans in comparison to hindgut fermenters such as cows, you would clearly see that our anatomy is only suited for animal foods and very, very minuscule amounts of plans. This is just the reality of things. You're of course in denial, you're brainwashed. In many ways it is not your own fault of course, you simply do not know. You're talking about blind faith, <laughs> but how did you come to your conclusion? Do you really believe it was your free will? Do you really believe you made a rational, logical decision in malnourishing yourself? It doesn't add up at all. You have no nutritional background, so how can you, <laughs> how can you make a decision about diet if you have no nutritional background whatsoever, zero, you of course will base it on the ethics, but well, nutrition is a huge part of it, right? Because you still have to feed yourself. It is a mental illness, man. And the face-based thinking, the following blindly, just doing what you think is right, um, because you're just a, essentially a slave to your traditions. This, if I <laughs> and you are a slave to the system. Do you understand that there was absolutely no plant-based civilization ever in human history? Well, now you could say, Back in the day we raped each other, we did many, many evil things. Even though you didn't make an argument where evil comes from as an atheist. But well, let's put that aside. You do have to understand <laughs> that there are no supplements <laughs> that don't work anyways, found in the wild, in nature. You do understand that we cannot just change our biology right away. I know we live in a time where men want to become women and women want to become men, but we're still not at the point where they are changing their chromosomes or anything like that. They're simply cutting off their genitals and then they're pretending to be the other sex. Of course, it doesn't work that way and you cannot change the fact that you are a human being and that you have a human specific diet. It is what it is. Why don't you ask those questions? Questions. What's up with all those people in nature? What's up with all those people in the past? Was it always society? Always society. Society was always the detrimental factor for eating meat. If you're truly interested, I do recommend a book by Weston A. Price. It is a man who traveled the world and visited many indigenous tribes and came to the conclusion that meat is and always will be an essential part to human health. He actually was a dentist and was interested in vegetarianism and this is why he started visiting those tribes in order to find an argument for vegetarianism. <laughs> of course, he couldn't find one. I'm honest, um, 
the reactions that I was receiving, these kinds of reactions, only made me want to talk about it more. A lot of people weren't very happy with this shift when I started talking about this. I mean, first, first this kid comes for the creator of the heavens and the earth, the alpha and the omega, and it, as if that wasn't bad enough, now he wants me to give up eating bacon too. Well, yes, I'm afraid to say. Um, because this point isn't just one of philosophical musing, this is more a point of duty. And in fact, the most basic duty, that, and the most self-evident duty, that we can possibly have as ethical beings, that's to avoid <laughs> inflicting suffering where it can be avoided. Uh, uh, okay, where do ethics come from? I'm not going to even bother to ask anymore. There is no point. It comes from society, I guess. It comes from popular consensus, whatever. Right now, in this day and age, with the so-called pandemic, Yes, it is an ethical obligation to care about what we eat. Sure. Quote attributed to Carl yes. Sagan that is very commonly repeated among the atheist skeptic community is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's a favorite concept, <laughs> you'll have heard it all the time. Um, some people call it Hitchens uh. Razor because of how he likes to employ the term. I would like to humbly add to this great tradition by suggesting a razor of my own. That extraordinary harm and mistreatment requires extraordinary justification. Very, very simple. Yet again, the justification is that it is your species-specific diet that if you eat any other way, you will be sick. You won't live up to your God-given or call it nature-given, call it whatever you will, I don't really care, potential. It is impossible for you to be perfectly healthy on a so-called vegan diet. That's it. And that justifies everything. At least it's true to me as Carl Sagan's pithy maxim. And yet when reflecting on a treatment of animals, it's not just the case that we don't have extraordinary justification for extraordinary harms. We don't even have ordinary justifications, yes, even for the do. most basic mistreatment of animals that we currently partake <laughs> in. <laughs> and look at the sheep just clapping. Oh, wow. I think not enough time is spent reflecting on the fact that in the normal course of human ethical intuition, the more innocent the victim, the more we think they require and deserve our attention and special moral concern. Right? That seems obvious, right? It's worse for me to smack a baby than to smack an adult because one is so much more innocent than the other. But once you cross the species boundary, this intuition seems to be exactly reversed. Now the more Yeah, and why is that so? Hmm? The more defenseless, the more innocent, the more domitable the being, the more we have we feel we have a right to abuse them. But how is it abuse exactly? You give them perfect living conditions. Any animal, if it would have any type of rationality, which it doesn't, would choose a factory farm over the wild every single time. It is that simple. In nature, in the wild, many animals get eaten as babies. The babies that you just spoke about. Of course, not human babies, they're just animals, but this happens in nature. They get eaten as babies. If not, they die horrific deaths. They get eaten from the ass up, that's what happens. Most of the time they get dragged by the genitals because it is a weak point and then eaten from the butt up. This is really what is happening. Horrific deaths, or they starve, or they get injured, or they get infections, and they never heal, etc, etc, etc. It is a gruesome environment in nature. So, in many ways, the symbiotic relationship between animals and humans is the best thing that ever happened to animals. It is what it is. And let me remind you, right, we're talking... If we talk about animal ethics, that is. About, I don't need to explain to a room full of vegans that we're talking about torture and abuse, but what I will remind you is that in a human context, in liberal thinking at least, when it comes to torture, think about this. When you of course he's a liberal as well. <laughs> what else? Or something like this. We don't justify torturing our enemies, even when we have a good reason to do it. But how do we torture animals? Honestly, it's just a bolt gun to the head and it's over. There's no torture at all. Actually, in factory farms, they don't even have time to torture animals. Even if they wanted to, there would be some sort of sadist that wants to torture animals all day long. They don't have time for that. Most of the time, in the morning, they have to kill off 500 sheep or 500 cows or whatever. It goes very, very quick. And yet we do justify torturing the most innocent members of our moral oh. community simply to appease our taste buds. Our ethical intuitions exactly reverse themselves for uh, no... Yeah, because some people still do have 
intuition, not only so-called ethical intuition, but some people still know right from wrong. Some people still have body awareness. They do understand what does what in their own bodies. They do understand that if they eat something that doesn't belong there, then they will get sick. This is why intuitively people crave meat, because Yet again, it is our species-specific diet. Get over it. Good reason. And the worst thing, the very worst thing about this, <laughs> the very worst, is that those who are paying for this don't think they need to give an explanation at all, because it's just a burger, right? It's us. It's the they vegans don't. who are putting forward the affirmative case who need to do the explaining, right? And I'm here to tell you, right, that this is what I think. This is a, this is a, a takeaway that I'd like you all to leave with: is that if we're going but who cares what you think? <laughs> it is your own moral, ethical worldview. You didn't tell us what you based it on at all. We do not know what type of consequences, quote unquote, we would face if we don't adhere <laughs> by your worldview. So why would we listen to you at all? We're going to make it anywhere as a movement. We need to fix this. Eating animals is not the neutral position. If you walk into KFC and buy a bargain bucket, you are demonstrating that you implicitly accept an ideology that says that you have the ethical warrant to harm an animal for the sake of your taste pleasure. Now, say what you like about that kind of belief, but don't uh, tell me that. Uh, I don't want to repeat myself, but on the other hand, he is very repetitive. Taste pleasure, taste pleasure, taste pleasure. It is not taste pleasure. <laughs> it is a nutritional need. Do you understand? Just because some vegans brainwashed you online and told you you do not need animal foods in order to be healthy doesn't make it right. The vegans that you associated yourself with have detrimental health effects. It is what it is. Many of them are bleeding out of their butts. Many of them are depressed, have some sort of eating disorder. Do you understand where that comes from? That comes directly from veganism. That's the neutral position. Don't tell me that we're the ones with the ideology for wishing for this to end. That's not how it works. <laughs> yes. When I refuse <laughs> to kill another human being, I'm not doing something uh. affirmative. I'm refraining from doing something. And when I refuse to kill another animal, I'm not doing something. I'm refraining. And why is this important? Well, what is the biggest <sighs> problem that the Doesn't vegan matter. community currently faces? If you ask me, it's PR. I hate to have to say. We have a bit of a bad image, right? Whenever we get a mention in the news or on social media, God, God forbid, TikTok. God forbid. <laughs> it's always that we're extreme, fanatical, we seem frantic, this kind of stuff. Now, why is this the case? I actually think this is quite understandable. When we consider that most people see veganism as the affirmative thing. I mean, think about what we're talking about. We're talking about mutilation. We're talking about bolt gunning gas chambers, diseases, all kinds of horrible stuff, right? Of course diseases. the rhetoric is going to sound extreme. So you still believe in the zootic origin of the current situation? <laughs> that is great. The extremity of our discourse is only reflective of the extremity of what we're doing to animals, right? And so once it becomes clear that veganism oh, man. is a reaction to this rather than its proposition, then those people who are pointing their fingers at extremity will realize that Actually, they are correct to do so. They are pointing at extremity, but the finger should be pointing in the opposite direction. When you realize that it, this all comes down to the fact that veganism is seen as the thing that's done, and eating meat is seen as the thing that's not done, that's where I think the basic problem lies. Vegans also, unfairly, I think, of course, have a reputation of trying to force their views on other people. I'm sure you'll have heard this charge yourself, which it's not true, by the way. I don't even know what that would look like. Where are these roaming gangs of vigilante vegans holding people at gunpoint, forcing them to eat a tofu burger? It's nonsense. It doesn't exist. Oh, well, I would disagree with that. You have, of course, radical animal activists, so, <laughs> so called, that storm farms and try to rescue animals, right? You have so-called, again, animal activists that go out in public naked, covered in blood, shocking little children. So yeah, I would say that is forcing your beliefs. <laughs> but I'm glad to hear from these people that they um, seem to not like when people force their opinions on others. I take them a lot more seriously, I have to say, if they would stop forcing their opinions upon animals, right? That would make me take them a lot more seriously. <laughs>
Uh, that is such a mental illness, but we are not forcing our opinions on the animals. We are simply doing what is absolutely natural, what is God-given, what is human nature, what is right. That's what we are doing. So therefore, we are eating animals. We don't have a debate with animals uh, and we try to force our beliefs onto them. We simply eat them. That's it. After all, wow. live and let live only works if you let live, right? It seems obvious to me. And what I think they mean when they say this is... But that is a human concept. Yet again, man, this is so religious, it's beyond belief. You project your worldview onto animals. It is so blatantly obvious. Live and let live. Yeah, tell that to a tiger, tell that to a lion, tell that to any animals, tell it to a spider. Live and let live. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is a human concept that you obviously cannot project onto animals. It's crazy how people see this guy here as some sort of philosopher king. How does this work? That vegans like to force other people into considering the consequences wow. of their actions. This is a fairer claim. I think this is, this is more accurate. Um, but I have to say that what I wish, the answer to this, that I wish someone had the gall to say to me before I was vegan a few years ago, is quite simple. A few right? years I'll ago. accept the, the charge that we try to force people into unwarranted, into, into uncomfortable conversations, but let me put it plainly. If you have the right to force a pig into a gas chamber, then you can be damn sure I have the right to force you into a conversation about your justification for doing so. Total false equivalent. Yet again, animals are not part of society. So what somebody does to an animal is not on the same level of you having a debate with them, especially not when it justifies nutritional needs. Do you understand this? No. But of course, I don't need to tell any of you this. This is just a way to get a cheap applause uh, for the sake of a good YouTube video. Um, this, it's you're, great. You're all, the fact that you're all here just means that you're, you're already sympathetic to the vegan message, at least. But I wanted to give you an idea of why I've ended up here today, um, on this <laughs> stage today, despite once being such a lover of meat that they knew my order in KFC without even having to ask. I want to speak about why, as an atheist, I began to feel a true affinity with the vegan community. Surprisingly, the debate around veganism and the debate about religion actually have uh, some interesting parallels, as I briefly mentioned. Yep, it all does. I don't think I mentioned uh, atheism. Let me cut you off right there yet again. It all does. Your whole persona is essentially a copy of a copy of a copy. Liberal, atheist, vegan. It is always the same because those things go hand in hand. It is always the same origin and the origin is fear. That's what it is. It is fear. It is emotion. It is falsehood. This is where all of this comes from. In this world, there's only right and wrong. There's only love and fear. That's it. You're either motivated by love or you're motivated by fear. And I'm not talking about your emotional perception of love. Oh, I like to pet this animal. Therefore, it is right. No, it is not. Everything originates out of love if it is in its natural state. Therefore, yes, I know this is hard to grasp for the atheist, but even the lion eating the gazelle originates from pure love. This is where it comes from because it is true. Simple as that. Once you open yourself up to deception, it is a steep way down. You just stumble across false ideology after the other. It is a free fall from here. It's not a thing that people do, right? It's a thing that people don't do. And yet, uh, despite this, historically, atheism has been called radical, extreme, insensitive to important traditions. <laughs> Uh, inconvenient, just something a bunch of kind of young radical. But it is not, man. If you don't believe in God, you simply wouldn't talk about it. To be an anti theist is by definition to be against something. Obviously, even being anti vegan, obviously, I'm getting a lot of backlash as well because I'm anti something. I can't fathom that you don't understand this. You must be joking or you're really so far gone. Of course, you're against something. It is in the word. You're an atheist. Let's get together and blindly follow. Sound familiar? Anybody? Right? Seems to me that when I, well, when I first heard that veganism has a reputation for these things too, I began to hear the echoes of people who'd been saying this about uh, atheists 
for centuries and, and for the whole time been talking out of the, uh, well, talking out of, there are children here, their, their digestive system appears to be working in reverse, put it that way. Now, vegans have, I think, unfortunately, a reputation for being of quite an evangelical bent themselves, and so one of the yeah. most boring uh, claims that I hear, that people try to shut me up about animal yeah. rights, especially because I used to be an atheist, or I used to talk about atheism, I should say, um, is the claim that by becoming a vegan, I've joined a new religion myself. Yeah. I'm sure you'll have heard this too, this, this charge, that uh, veganism is some kind of religion. To be plain, whilst religion is a faith-based pursuit, based in wishful thinking and the desire for supernatural consolation, it takes absolutely no faith, none, to recognize the undeniable truth of animal suffering. And believe me, it doesn't provide any consolation. At least for the religious, the concept of hell, as disgusting and threatening a concept that it is, the concept of hell is something that already exists. Right? It's already there. God made it. It's not their fault that hell exists. Um, <laughs> and we only experience it after we're dead. And even all not of this true. is based on, shall we say, tentative evidence. Not true at all. Ever heard the term hell on earth? This is where you are in if you don't follow God's plan, if you don't follow the law. It is very, very simple. There are certain laws in the universe. I'm going to use that terminology in hope that you will be able to follow because many atheists, when you say God, they automatically just shut down. There are certain rules within this. I like to say creation, but then again, I'm going to face a brain blockage. There are certain rules in this world. Right? And if you don't follow them, you will suffer. It is that simple. So if you jump off a building, there is a thing called gravity, and then you will suffer. The consequences is just normal. If you behave in a certain way, you will suffer consequences as well. For example, if you are the perceived nice guy all the time, you will fall short in life. It is what it is. This is how this dynamic works here. The certain rule sets, it is just that simple. If you put stuff into your body, that doesn't belong there, then you will get sick. Therefore, you create hell on earth and you are in it. You're suffering right now. Right. Animal farming, conversely, creates hell where it didn't exist before and doesn't just use it as a, as a threat for bad behavior. Uh, but how? Yet again, the environment in nature, in the wild, is 10,000 times harsher than any farm. So how does it create hell. Yet again, it proves that you simply watched a couple of documentaries and now you are highly emotional, like a woman. You're very, very emotional. You're triggered. And this is why you believe that there is hell in those farms. But proactively breeds beings into existence just to experience it for the entirety of their life. And where the religious, in my view, don't have nearly enough evidence to support the claim that their hell actually exists and could do with a lot more of it. Factory farms have the exact opposite problem of having an overwhelming amount of evidence that their hell on earth does truly exist, that they have to try and obfuscate or deny. As my friend... Yeah, yet again, vegans have an overwhelming evidence that their diet is detrimental to their health, <laughs> psychologically, physically, etc. And Steve Woodford once said to me, if you were the devil and you were trying to create the worst possible experience for animals just for the sake of suffering itself. You actually couldn't do much better than what we're already doing to them on factory farms. And suppress this evidence they... You actually could <laughs> go into nature yet again. They do, right? or at least they try their best. We're all familiar with the, the propaganda that we see flooding our supermarket aisles, free range, happy cows, all of this kind of stuff, which is, of course... But why is free range propaganda? It's nothing more than a fantasy. You can stick a free-range label on chickens that are housed, or on eggs that come from chickens that are housed in barns at a density of nine chickens per square meter, and whose male populations have been massacred at birth because they won't produce any eggs. But don't worry, the sticker seems to suggest that the, chick uh, the chickens were perfectly fine with it. These companies think we're stupid. And they're right. <laughs> yeah, they're absolutely right. <laughs> given how willing people are, to uncritically accept this kind of stuff and these ridiculous labels without even a hint of skepticism that maybe, just, just maybe, companies that are dedicated to producing as much animal flesh 
or as cheaply as possible, might just allow animal welfare standards to slip by the side. So, why is it that so many of my atheist colleagues don't bring this up? I mean, the problem of evil for God's existence is made a thousand times worse when you consider the plight of animals. Why don't, I, I spend a lot of time thinking, why don't more of my atheist colleagues talk about this? Why is it only us? And I think it's because for a lot of them, if they were to point to that. But it seems after studying theology so long, you still didn't grasp the concept at all. You don't talk about the aspect of the fallen creation, which explains why we find ourselves in such a state, why there is death. You seem not to know, genuinely. Heavens, and say, how can you call yourself a good God while allowing so many animals to suffer? The heavens could point right back and say, well, how can you call yourself a moral person and continue to pay for these animals to suffer? That's why they're not talking about it. This, this can really help. This can really help our case. I also campaigned for the secularization of the United Kingdom, a country which, let's face it, doesn't care about Jesus in the way that it used to. I think it should be secularized. But secularism- All right, guys. And this is it. The video is long enough as it is. And I think I said everything that is needed to be said. The guy is repeatedly on a rant about his own emotions, about how everything makes him feel, but fails to give an argument where this evil comes from and fails to understand that it is proper human nutrition that is at stake here. What he wants is a secular government, an atheistic government, where we essentially, in the end, give up all our human freedoms under the disguise of human rights. Abortion will be legal, LGBTQ, P, whatever. In the end, he's talking about a degenerating society that has no moral standard whatsoever other given by the government, which is secular and liberal. Fantastic. You created hell on earth. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. Long enough. As I said, if you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel, it is highly appreciated. Please check out the links in the description box. Thank you very much. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.